Thank you, guys. It's uh, lovely to be here and glad to make a Wednesday afternoon a uh, little story for you guys. So this is really nice. Um, and thank you, David and uh, B&H, for your, your hospitality. Um, so are you guys into portraiture? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So my... Uh, Let's see, I guess I can see this. My early days started in, and we're, and we're going to talk about um, music in particular. My early days in, uh, in uh, editorial um, sort of started with a whirlwind of, of different kind of assignments, but I found myself at Rolling Stone uh, doing some, some pretty creative stuff. But in the early days, I wasn't on contract. I just got assignments. And my first assignment was to shoot LL Cool J in his uh, house in, at Hollis, Queens. And I went up to, to his house, which is his grandmother's house, and he was still asleep and she ran me off with a, a broom. But um, he finally woke up and we, we did this, this particular shot. And then as I started to uh, get familiar with Rolling Stone and they got familiar with me, uh, I got sent out to LA to photograph Jane, Jane's addiction, specifically uh, Perry Farrell. And uh, this is out in Perry's backyard. This is another really early photograph for me. It was um, Public Enemy. And in this uh, particular image, I, I, uh, I set up my lights, which was kind of broad daylight at the time. And then we waited for the band to show up after about five hours. And, uh, and they finally did. And then we did a roll of film. And then we got chased off by the police. But um, was. A, uh, an interesting time for me because I was using, these are all analog, and I was using uh, a Hasselblad. It was the first time to kind of explore with a square. Once I kind of cemented my, my relationship with Rolling Stone, uh, the, the, the kind of pinnacle moment happened for me after a couple of years, and they asked me to do a cover. But it was a very rushed uh, experience where Paul Simon uh, wasn't even in the studio when Lady Smith Black Mombaza showed up, and I got a call from him, and he said, uh, you think we can pull this off in a couple of hours? And I said, I think we can, and he showed up. And uh, we spent about 15 minutes when he arrived listening to them sing Graceland, which was uh, a pretty memorable moment. But this was uh, my first cover for Rolling Stone. So one of the things that uh, was a, uh, kind of a highlight for me when I started to work for Rolling Stone was, was to obviously do covers, because covers is a, a very unique experience. First of all, you know, in a time when people went to newsstands and enjoyed newsstands, cover was really, like, that was the, that was the big deal. And, uh, and so they started trying me out on different uh, 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 entertainers. One of them happened to be Sam Kinison who was also doing music at the time as well. But he was kind of the rock and roll comedian. And then my third cover was with Lou Reed. And I remember this particular session because Lou got to our location, which was downtown Manhattan. And um, he didn't have the right pair of glasses on. So I sat there and tried to talk to Lou Reed, which was uh, pretty quiet, actually, uh, about uh, life. And uh, while we waited for his glasses. But anyway, this was my third cover, and I got a little bit of, in trouble for this one because it was a little dark for them. But I guess when you think about Lou Reed, that, that sort of makes a lot of sense. Then as I started to explore music more and more with my photography, I realized that I had um, a very uh, good relationship with photographing groups of people. And, uh, and so one of my first bands that I got to photograph for the cover was uh, the Black Crows. And then Aerosmith. Then in 92, uh, so that was kind of in the late, very late 80s into the 90s. In 92, I was asked to do a portfolio for the 25th anniversary of, uh, of Rolling Stone. And I was, uh, I was very tickled to be able to do this. I was, I was working uh, in kind of a platform with a bunch of other photographers doing portfolios. It was like Herb Ritz, it was Kurt Marcus, it was Bruce Weber. Um, so the, so the, it was a nice group of people to be involved with in terms of the photography. And so my first, very first session was going to be with Fleetwood Mac. 
And, uh, and so I had come accustomed to being able to put my ideas out first, draw them out, figure out what I wanted to do, and then talk to the artist before we went too far down the road. So I called Mick Fleetwood, I got his number, they said you could call him at the studio. I called Mick Fleetwood, he gets on the phone and he goes, hello Mark, nice to talk to you. He goes, what are your ideas? And I said, well, you guys are celebrating your 25th anniversary, Rolling Stone selling, <coughs> celebrating their 25th anniversary, so I thought it'd be great if you guys did a wedding picture, you and John McPhee. And Mick says, ooh, I like that idea. I goes, I have one little favor. And I go, what's that? And he goes, like, can I be the bride? So that's... That's kind of where you want to end up. Like, that's called a willing subject. So then, one of my next one was uh, photographs or portraits was with Ringo Starr. So I mean, think about a kid like growing up in Texas, all of a sudden, you're going to go photograph one of the Beatles. That's a pretty cool thing. So in my sketch pad, I was thinking like, what makes a really good drummer? I was writing down lists and I said like, well, maybe he would have multiple hands, or maybe he would be a god or a goddess or something. So I came up with this idea of sort of a Shiva-related idea of, of Ringo. And, um, and my assistant, we had actually Ariane Phillips, who was the costume designer, built a different set of arms for us from the, from the same material she made the shirt in. And my assistant slipped his hands through Ringo's arms, and we did, you know, Two pairs of arms. This is the late Jeff Beck. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm sure you do, that Jeff Beck just passed away. And this, again, was a, a very spontaneous moment where his wife was feeding sheep, and she brought him over to where we were taking a picture. So uh, we call that lo-fi. So again, through the 25th anniversary, this was a picture I did of Fats Domino. So I kind of never know where I'm going to end up. This particular picture, I was at a venue waiting for Fats to show up after a show. And, uh, and he was already in his undershirt getting ready to put on a fresh shirt. I said, oh, no, 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 just stay like that. You look great. And I had a little spritzer that I carried in my back pocket. And I spritzed him a little bit with water. And we did this black and white picture. Uh, so this is the Allman Brothers. This is uh, Greg Allman and, uh, and Dwayne. And so this was in uh, Macon, Georgia. I mean, uh, Dickie Betts, sorry. And so then I actually got to photograph a second beetle. So this was George Harrison. Now the funny thing about George, I'm not going to tell a ton of stories about everybody, but George, <clears throat> I was told, liked a ukulele, by, who I was just photographing Tom Petty. And so I got a couple of ukuleles, and after the shoot, and I knew that he was reluctant because he didn't like a review from uh, Rolling Stone from uh, 1972 from Dark Horse. He's kind of mad about being in Rolling Stone. But anyway, we had a good time and got in the ukulele. We played some songs together. We, we listened to him, and then at the very end, he said, Mark, it's been, it's been really nice. And he, and he grabbed one of these rental ukuleles, which was not you know, inexpensive. It was a Martin. And he starts walking away with it. And I go, hey, hey George, um, that's, a, that's a rental. And he goes like, oh, go ahead and just bill yon winner. So I thought that was kind of cool. Well, I had to, I had to bill yon winner, not, not George. So th this was a kind of a wonderful moment where, where Tom, uh, I was also for the 25th anniversary, I was photographing Tom Petty. And Tom didn't really know what, he wanted to do for the photograph, and I said, well, you know, we were kind of being loose. I said, and the house is great. Let me look in your wardrobe. And he had this, he had this cowboy robe. And I said, this is great. This is, I want to photograph you in your robe. And he goes, well, okay. And he put on the robe, and he comes out, and he's wearing jeans. I go, no pants. So um, he reluctantly took his pants off for me. That's Jimmy Page. This is uh, in his castle. So these are all grouped together. So this was a pretty expansive portfolio. The great Carlos Santana, very, very stoned, I should tell you. So that was the 25th anniversary. Right after that, I got asked by the magazine to become their chief photographer, which I was blown away. And uh, I had that job from 1992 to 2002. And one of the wonderful things about being uh, affiliated with a magazine like Rolling Stone is that 
you really get to explore. You get, you get to try things out. You know the magazine's going to support you, which is really kind of a wonderful, unique relationship. And, um, and so I started to dig into a kind of a more simplified idea of portraiture. And so this is John Lee Hooker. You can see like if there's a kind of a reductive quality to it. I'm playing with light. I'm some, most of this stuff is large format or medium format. Chris Cornell. So this shot in particular was a, a little bit of a breakthrough for me because I was actually photographing, again, I was photographing Tom Petty for another story. And, um, and well, he must know, he, he knows every musician. So I saw him as photographing Johnny. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, you're going to love him. He's a, he's a, he's a very powerful guy. Um, uh, you know, just maybe watch him and see, kind of get a, get a, get a radar on him. So I went to his show. We were in uh, we were in Vegas, and I went to his show, and I saw that he took his guitar, and he flipped it behind his back during a performance. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Like you still know that's Johnny Cash, and so we did a portrait out in the desert in Las Vegas, and then we went back to a hotel room and we set up a kind of a simple gray background in this hotel room I was staying in, and he brought his guitar and I did this picture. Then I went in the dark room and I printed everything down and created this kind of, like almost like a, a Batman, the Batman of country music, I call him, or Superman. So another great moment for me, and, and, and you guys could probably relate in terms of like when you get to meet your idols, is that like Neil Young for me, musically, was, uh, was, was the, he was the, the creme de la, de la creme. And so when I met Neil for the shoot, I said that I wanted to, um, to do a couple of different things, one of them being a, a, a serious portrait, but we went in, the idea is that we went into his trailer and he had this closet full of flannel shirts. So I said, uh, I said, well, what do you want to wear? And he goes, well, I got a green one, a blue one, a yellow one, and a, and a red one. So I, that, that was his wardrobe. Anyway, that's kind of the joke. So I, I was still steering in a direction of, of a balance between really conceptual photographs and simple portraits. And then again, I had another highlight in my career where I got to photograph the Rolling Stones. And what was so cool is that they were putting out a record um, which I think was Voodoo Lounge, and I get a call from their manager, and they said, like, hey, Mick wants you to come to London. And I said, well, great, that sounds fantastic. He goes, like, today. And I said, okay, well, all right, I can, I can, I can work that out. And so, three-hour flight, get there, and uh, meet with Mick the following day, flew back, set up, we had a huge set, and then I also want to do these simple portraits, so we, we stuck these in. This is Mick and Keith. So right about that time, we were experiencing a change in, in music. And um, <clears throat> I got a call from Courtney Love's people. Uh, I had worked with REM, and, and Michael Stipe had recommended me for a session with Courtney Love, which I thought, you know, great. I mean, Courtney Love's weird. I like that. And so I went and I did this publicity picture with her, which uh, was, was wonderful. We had a good time. Um, and we went, later went on to do a lot of work together. But she also, who she was married, obviously, to Kurt Cobain at the time. She, she introduced me to Kurt. And so one of the first uh, uh, moments I had with Nirvana was to go to Australia and do a cover for Rolling Stone right after Nevermind had broken. So I'm in, I'm in Melbourne getting ready to do this shoot. I'm scouting locations. I'm super crazy trying to get everything orchestrated, right? And so I go to the concert. I, sh I, I, I get to meet the guys before, except for Kurt wasn't there. And I went up to Dave and Chris and I said, you know, I, I've studied a lot of your photographs. I know you guys wear t-shirts with writing on it. And I was like, you know, band names and things like that that they're, they're um, you know, they're, they're publicizing, local bands. So I was like, you know, if you wouldn't mind telling Kurt, since he's not here, just don't wear anything with writing on it because it'll really distract from the, the copy. And they were like, cool, we'll tell him, no problem. So I'm thinking, okay, this is all going to work out great. We drive out to the location. 
Their van pulls up. I'm having all kinds of crazy problems with my Australian equipment. And all of a sudden I see Chris and Dave, and they come out of the van, and they're laughing. I'm going like, what the, why are you guys laughing? They go like, you'll see. <laughs> Kurt gets out of the van, and he's wearing his, you know, he's wearing his, uh, his button-up sweater, and he unbuttons it, and it says, corporate magazines still suck. <laughs> well, you wonder, like, wouldn't you know that you don't tell, you know, the punk kid not to do something, because you're definitely going to get the opposite response. So I sweat my hmm <laughs> off all the way back to Melbourne. I think I had messed it all up. And as, uh, as I uh, got back into New York, I sent my pictures in, and I get a call from Rolling Stone. They are so delighted with the photograph, and they're going to run it as is. And that was kind of cool. Like, I thought we were going to have to, you know, touch it out. But nope, it ran. So anyway, that embraced me to the band. The band thought I was kind of a cool guy to be able to pull this off. Well, they didn't think I was that cool. So when the next record came out in utero, uh, I was requested to, to do the cover from Rolling Stone, and the band was very open to it. So I thought my answer to the Rolling Stone cover, the first one, would be them in Brooks Brothers suits, because obviously they were successful. And much to my amazement, they liked the idea. And here's one of the photographs we did during the, um, during the session. And then this portrait was a portrait that I did on Polaroid film with a you guys know what type 55 Polaroid is? Now, type 55 Polaroid gives you a negative and a Polaroid. So I was shooting film, but I, I saw this Polaroid. I thought, man, this thing's pretty damn good. So I kept it in my little bucket, and I walked my bucket through the airport. People were like, are you going fishing? Like, nope, this is my bucket. And uh, got back, and I, and, I, and I got the rest of the film back after a couple of days, and this picture really became much more interesting than any of the film I had shot because he had let his guard down because it was a Polaroid, which I thought was pretty kind of cool. Then, two months later, we hear the news that Kurt's dead. And then this picture became the memorial issue. The same day that Kurt died, I was in Paris. I'd wake up to the phone call. I'm shooting Counting Crows. And I get a message from uh, my editor at Rolling Stone, and they said, like, hey, Kurt Cobain's dead. He shot himself last night. And I was like, oh, my God. And I just, like, you know, like in the world, we were crushed. And, I, uh, and so I went, and I was trying to figure out what we are going to do, and the band was kind of weird and restless, and we tried to shoot, and it was just kind of messy. Nobody was in a good mood. And then for some reason, we finished with the band, and I went up there with Adam Duritz to... Uh, to the to, uh, top of Paris and uh, the Marmont section, and, uh, and we just sat down and had this artist paint him, and I took a couple of pictures while I was having a, co a coffee, sketch him. So nine months after that, I'm telling you sort of chronologically where things are going with music, because this is a, I mean, I'm still in a blur about everything, but so then I get a call about eight months later for Rolling Stone that Courtney wants to do a cover the first publicity she's going to do after the death of her husband. And so she and I had, had worked a little bit after that, or before that, and so I came up with this idea of just like kind of a, a sad ballerina, melancholy ballerina. We, did, we didn't shoot too long, just for an hour, but this is one of the pictures that came out of it. Pretty exciting stuff, huh, guys? Goddamn right. Thank you. We're going to talk for about till about 9:30 tonight, so I hope you guys got plenty of coffee and a catheter. So, so I'm still in Rolling Stone, having a great time, and I get the Beastie Boys. This shot, okay. So I had the idea of all three of them in Nick's outfits. I get there, and Adam tells me, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in a, in a basketball outfit. I want to be the referee, and I want to look like Al, uh, what's his name, Marv Albert. So go get me a wig. So we had to stop the shoot. Took a couple hours. We got a wig. Got him a referee outfit. And that was that. Was that. So Fiona Apple uh, loved her music, 
was really listening. Like when I do research, right, I'll listen to a record until like maybe a lyric triggers something. I'll write down a bunch of ideas. I'll go, I just flush it out. I spend days on it. And so she had this lyric about water and being under the water and just this like kind of very romantic, poetic kind of a storyline about the, the kind of the, the solidarity of, uh, and, and water obviously was a, a part of it. And so I did this picture, I built a tank and I had her floating in this, in this water tank. So I was, I was kind of like the rough and rugged photographer. I was, I was shooting, you know, like, you know, Jane's Addiction and I was shooting like, you know, Johnny Cash. So photographing women for me was like a real, like that was a departure. That was really, I was like, oh, I better get my A game on because I don't want to make, piss off the ladies. So um, I, I really boned up on my lighting and I figured out how to make people look super good. And remember, we're not doing a lot of retouching in these days. We're, you know, we're, 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 we're working a little bit with retouching, but we're really trying to keep everything in camera. Not like you young bucks today who get on your computers and make it look all sexy. So now here's another lady that I love, James Hatfield. And the thing about James is that he is, he is that guy. Like he is ready to just like go out in the cracked earth and that Satan, you know, strike a fire on his head and just wonderful guy to photograph, very animated. But we were in, the, in Florida, they were playing and I, and I got him just for an afternoon. And I was at a hotel, so we went out to this dump, which was really a dump that we were shooting in. I don't know what it was, some sort of toxic waste dump. Uh, hence the cracked earth. Uh, and then we went back to the hotel and I had set up a background, right? And the background was just for a headshot for the inside. So I had to do a cover and an inside picture. So I'm setting up, and I'll show you this next picture. We are pouring water over his head to create this, this demonic, crazy rock and roll picture. We're in the ballroom of this hotel. It's like a really nice, I don't know, like Hotel Six or whatever it was. And um, all of a sudden, this woman comes out. She goes like, so you're going to have to leave. We're having a bar mitzvah in 30 minutes. So I had to leave. Anyway, we got the demonic picture. James got invited to the bar mitzvah. I did not. So then I went into shooting, like I got, I got kind of pulled into the hip hop world, the rap world, which was, which I'd already done Public Enemy, so I was pretty good for the rest of my life. But then I got to meet Dr. Dre and Snoop. Now that was, that was a whole experience for me because I was in California, in Compton, all night long. I had no idea where I was. I was just trying to figure it out. They, were, they couldn't have been sweeter. And then um, we did find out that the reason why they were so accommodating is because Dr. Dre was on house arrest. So he really didn't have anywhere to go. Then I decided I was going to go for the, for the rock and roll androgynous look so I could use my beauty techniques that I had with Lauren Hill and adapt it to the heavy metal guy, uh, Sebastian Bach. And for those of you who don't do a lot of magazine work but are interested in magazine work as in, in, in terms of our editorial work as we, we call it now, that um, I worked with uh, a, a couple of wonderful stylists. So we would, we would team up together and we would consider what we would make for the shoot. Sometimes we would, we would find great clothes at, at stores for them and fashion for them, but sometimes we'd make things. So Ariane Phillips, who uh, I don't know if you know her name, incredible costumer, uh, she made these gold lame pants. The problem was that he got so drunk during the shoot and they were so tight that it took three of us to pull him off at the very end while he was laying on his back. <laughs> now, this was a controversial moment. This was uh, during the whole LA riot scene and uh, uh, Ice-T had just put out a record about cop, cop killers, a, a, song, a song titled Cop Killers. So we thought that we would, you know, kind of echo that a little bit since it was very controversial. And this again is with Ariane Phillips and we, we knew that Ice-T was a willing subject. We didn't know if he'd do this, but we had a cop outfit and he showed up and I said, I'm thinking about you as a cop. He goes, okay, cool. <laughs> and funny enough, now he is, he plays a cop. Like that's all he does. So I never got a residual. 
This is uh, my buddy Jacob Dillon. I've known Jacob since he was the, a youngster in the wallflowers. I was asked to photograph him. And then when, when the wallflowers blew up, I, I had a, a, the, the great fortune of being able to, to put him on the cover of Rolling Stone. And uh, I can honestly say, Jacob, I don't have a lot of friends that are rock and rollers, but Jacob is a friend of mine. He's a very, very sweet man. So now we're kind of like edging towards the, uh, the, the weird part of my career where I'm photographing like boy bands and girl bands and I'm having to really like pump up my game for the, uh, for the next uh, iteration of music. And so um, these are the Spice Girls, as you all know. And we were photographing them in my studio. And um, they came early, and I said, well, you guys are two hours early. We're not quite set up. And they said, that's okay. We're going to walk around the village. I live in West Village. And they came back, and they all had packages from the pink pussycat, which I really don't want to get into. But you can only imagine. So then I had an, another experience with probably 10 years later with Mick and Keith. Now, I want you to know I had nothing to do with their shirts. It was not my idea. But anyway, I thought this was kind of fun because I had photographed them 10 years before and then kind of the next, the next decade. This is the only time I was called a wanker um, on, a, on a shoot by an artist. <laughs> so the, the story behind this is this was a, 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 a rare moment for me where um, I had a band really mad at me. Right? So you're probably wondering, like, why would this band be mad at you? You got to photograph them naked, and they, you know, they didn't have to put on any clothes or anything like that. Why would they be mad at you? Mad at me because the guitar player got fired right after I did this shot, right? Not fired from the band. What did Rolling Stone do? They cut him out. <laughs> and the band never forgave me. I saw Anthony Kiedis once. He goes, I'm still not talking to you. Now here's an idea for you. You go and you're working with a band. I had a million ideas that I was working out with them. They said like, I think it was Lars, because it was because like, man, we got this idea, this really cool idea. Now this is just like, we're in broad daylight, and, you, and I go, yeah, because we want to do this picture of the four of us doing this. <laughs> I mean, like, this is like broad daylight. And it's like, like that, I'm going, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, Lars. <laughs> And he goes, well, this is, a, this is good. This is, you're going to understand it when we do in a kind of a black bar, dark background, very dark. And I was like, okay, cool. And so I, we went in and we started saying, I said, oh, God, it's Skull and Crossbones. He goes, yeah. So we, anyway, that was it. But it was, a great, it, was a great, it was a great idea. I, have to, I mean, Lars, he's got great ideas. And I have a couple, too. This is uh, Meat uh, Puppets. I don't know why they're dressed as uh, Seventh Avenue prostitutes, but um, I think because I live so close to the meatpacking district, I just was inspired. This is Danzig. And, you know, if ever you have ideas that just aren't working, just go to fire. <laughs> really, because, you know, devil worshipers, rock and rollers, everybody loves a good fire. Melissa Etheridge. So let me tell you guys about production. Now, I broke my back a couple of times doing production because I used to do a lot of it myself. So I pulled these trees in from a little store in Los Angeles and took them out to the desert and planted them, my assistant and I. And then we had to take them back because they were rental. Michelle Din Degocello, I just loved her music. I just thought she was the coolest. But I had this idea to pour paint on her head. Anyway, she let me. I, I really got into pouring things over people's heads for a, a, a good part of my career. And then I started to put people in sardine cans. And uh, so this is a true story. I went to Vermont to photograph fish. Now, I had this idea, right? So I think this is the way my brain thinks. I think fish, fish, sardines, guys in a sardine can. So I go to the local supermarket. We had a 
We had a box already cut out because I knew where I was going to go. And I told fish I was going to do something kind of special. I, I figured I'm not going to tell them I'm going to put them in olive oil. I got 40 gallons of olive oil. And I poured it in this wooden container. And I said, well, you know, you guys are we're going to do a sardine picture. And they were like, that's cool. It's pretty stoned. So we, we got him in the, in the 40 gallons of oil. And then I went back and I photographed a sardine can in my studio. And, and that was my fish. So this guy, this guy, he was such a sweetheart back then. He was, I mean, I don't think he had $40 in his back pocket, but he was so nice and so lovely. And this is the first picture in Rolling Stone of him. When I did my first book, I had, uh, it was uh, my first uh, retrospective was in the, uh, right around 2000. And I had a, a pretty nice collection of pictures, but I had one artist that I had never gotten. I was so miserable, I had never gotten Tom Waits. So I met his manager at something, and I knew the book was closing. It was, just, it was just fortuitous that I ran into him. I said, hey man, any chance I can photograph Tom? He goes, oh no, Tom doesn't, he, wouldn't, he would never, I'll ask him. Anyway, Tom said yes for my book. I was, I was excited, I got to work with Tom. So he says, yeah, yeah, he says, I got some ideas for you. But he said, uh, uh, meet us at the graveyard at, uh, at uh, 6.30, the sun goes down. And uh, uh, I'll bring a wheelbarrow and uh, dig a hole, big, dig a big hole in the graveyard. It was up in Northern California. I was like, y you what? You want me to dig a grave? Goes, yeah, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fine. No one cares. Sure enough, we go there, my sister and I, we go and we dig a four-foot hole in the middle of a graveyard. Nobody even batted an eye. We're just, yeah, we're just getting, Tom Waits passed on, we're just getting ready to bury him. So, I do, I do ask people to do things that, that, are, that are highly unusual. And um, I, I'm a big fan of Lyle Lovett. I, if you guys know, if you probably have read a lot of stuff about me in the past. I like country music. Um, don't hold it against me. But um, anyway, I was a big fan of Lyle. We grew up in Houston together. I had seen him a couple of times in the early days. And so I just thought he was a lot of fun. A lot of fun, nice guy. Um, so I, 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 I threw him a party. Blind Melon. I was a huge Talking Heads fan, and uh, I was, again, I was uh, beside myself when I got the call to photograph David Byrne. And um, I don't think he said three things to me that day, but I got a, a couple of nice photographs. Michael Stipe. Then I got the call to photograph Bob Dylan. So this was really kind of an amazing moment. I'd, I'd met Jacob, worked with Jacob a couple of times, and um, got a call to photograph Bob. He's going to come over to your studio. I was living in Soho at the time. He's coming to your studio, super low key. He said, manager says, don't shake his hand. Whatever you do, don't shake his hand. So I was, all right, cool. I'm going to shake Bob Dylan's hand. I don't need to do that. So the elevator comes up. Bob Dylan walks out. He's carrying a little garment bag, and he goes, how you doing? I'm Bob. And he's like, I was like, I'm not the germaphobe. But here we go. Anyway. Bruce Springsteen at 49 years old. I've had a lot of rockers I got to photograph at 49 years old. So this is my country section, because I know you guys love country music. So true story, Willie Nelson's going to be 90 years old this year. Happy birthday, Willie. So this is a picture. Probably the only photographer to say, like, hey, Willie, do you mind taking your shirt off? <laughs> I like this photograph because it, it, it wasn't intentional, but it was probably subliminal in my mind to kind of a Curtis moment with his hair. This is the legendary Bill Monroe. That's out in Bakersfield. That's Buck Owens. Loretta Lynn. Now, true story, I was 
going to Loretta's house to do this picture. Now I'm back to back on assignments doing this country portfolio. And I get to her house and there's nobody there. There's not a car in sight. There's a couple, I see like a guy in a tractor down the road and I see this woman just gardening, tomato garden. I said, hey, I'm looking for Loretta. And she goes like, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> so uh, she changed her shirt and we went into this picture. Listen to Williams. This is my Amy Lou. This is really kind of, a, okay, a little quick little story here. So I was, like Merle for me was the greatest songwriter in country music. I used my, besides Hank Williams. And so it was, a, it was a great thrill to photograph him. And so I was told by his manager, he says like, you know, go around, look for some locations, and then when you guys find what you want to do, I'll tell Merle, and please tell me what you want him to wear. I was like, well, you know, maybe a denim shirt, maybe like, you know, something kind of ragged, something cool, some distress. And Merle Haggard, you want him to look like a cowboy. He goes, okay, I'll do that. And I go, who are those guys over there painting the house? He goes like, well, that's the drummer. The guy on the windows, cleaning the windows, that's the bass player. And the guy over there gardening, that's the uh, pedal steel player. I thought, oh, okay, keeps him busy. So, um, so Merle comes out and I, and I see him standing over there and he's wearing, a, he's wearing a, this kind of crappy jacket, green jacket, and I walk over and he goes like, uh, I said, hey, I'm Mark Seliger from Rolling Stone. He goes like, I thought you were. He goes, if you don't like what I'm wearing, you can get off my property. I said. <laughs> No, I'm really, I love a members only jacket. I, I, I really do. I think they're just fantastic. Shot of Eddie Vedder. Now, Eddie, he was more reluctant than, than Kurt Cobain. So we, we had to do a cover shoot for the band and I just, I barely got away with even one photograph of him, but um, this is a reluctant Eddie Vedder. This is Jerry. So when you photograph Jerry uh, Garcia, you only had one hour. So you had to have three packs of Marlboros. I don't know how anybody smoked through three packs of Marlboros in an hour, but you had three packs of Marlboros and Dr. Pepper. And we made, again, Ariane Phillips worked with me on, she made a smock. We thought a smock would be nice for him. And we had a guitar and he was happy in a field, so. And then here's the house arrest picture. If you notice, Dr. Dre is wearing a bracelet, and that is not from Tiffany. <laughs> Riza? Zach? Kind of a nice moment with Joni Mitchell. I was a big fan of Joni's, so this was nice to have a, a portrait. Maxwell? And I've worked with Lenny. I met Lenny in, uh, on a shoot in 1987 or 88. And we worked together, we're still, we were still work together, we're still building a body of work. But this was for his record five. And this is a more recent photograph of him in the Bahamas for YSL. Then as I left Rolling Stone, I started to work a lot more with Vanity Fair. In fact, I was on contract with them for 10 years and I still work with them. So we did a, a Lisa Robinson, the legendary editor, did a hip hop portfolio. And so she, she kind of directed me more than I liked, but I tried to figure out how to make the pictures my own. So this is Nellie. How did I like that? Let's see. That is lit with a medium, I think a breezy strobe, but I used an overhead, a very, very lightweight overhead silk to block the sunlight so that it was getting more of the strobe than it was the uh, natural light. Kind of a mix. Bill, Dave, because, your photos have, or because your photos have such a heavy production quality to them, do you find yourself utilizing gapping techniques from cinema more than traditional? 100%. Yeah. I mean, more recently now than ever, um, one of the things I learned, uh, this, is, this is music work. I have a whole other life, which I, you know, is more kind of like fashion work and other things like that. And are you guys familiar with the Instagram stuff that we do uh, for the Oscars? So, so that, that work is specifically done on 
Well, using continuous lights. Yeah, so we only use, in the last five years, four years of doing that. So we use continuous lights, and I've been using a Sony camera, which is kind of, I'm, I'll give you my trade secrets, so don't get too excited. They closed down the bar over there anyway. Um, but the Sony, but so the Sony and that type of camera with the continuous gives me kind of an option to sort of almost be more cinematic with it. And so when we're working in the, in the um, set during the Oscar party, we have a guy on a board we're moving lights on and off. So we pre-program the lighting so that we can actually can change within two seconds. But I do find that a lot of the work that I'm doing now, as opposed to this work, is more using continuous lights and movie kind of experiences. And really it's because, you know, the latitude of digital has afforded us that op opportunity, right? So this is all for the, por the portfolio and in Vanity Fair. So literally we were in Times Square at two in the morning doing this picture. Puffy shows up, I don't know, like four hours late. I had just had jaw surgery like three days before, so I was in incredible pain. And um, he comes out, we're in the middle, literally in the middle of Times Square with a throne. <clears throat> he goes and goes like, I don't like the throne. I'm going like, got no choice, baby. This is it. Anyway. I convinced him. I'm just going to kind of haul through some of these just so you guys see these. You know, the, the Fugees. This picture was actually taken. It was kind of a, a happy mistake. I was photographing a RockAware campaign, which was Jay-Z's line of clothing, and we were on a trip in Africa. And he was getting ready to perform. And Beyonce was riding in the limo with him. And I said, hey, do you mind if I ride in the front and just take a couple pictures of you, Jay? But I did sneak in her into the corner. So when I moved to my studio on Charles Street, we had to remove an elevator cab, a uh, cab of an elevator from a, from, it was a horse stable back in like 1850s. And we had to put in a staircase because of egress and coating, so I had to take out this big elevator. When I took it out, there was this incredible skylight that was just like a, a Northlight studio. And then when I would photograph people, I'd ask them if they'd come up and do a couple portraits in the stairwell. And that turned into a whole body of work. And I'm, I also really love printmaking, so we started to do platinum palladium prints on this body of work. So these are couple of musicians that we worked with. Uh, the, the book was really spanned from uh, theater and artists and you know, writers and directors and musicians and performance uh, and some movie stars, but, um, but mainly it was like uh, connected with the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Another picture of David Byrne later as a janitor. David Bowie. And just, I, I just threw in kind of some of my favorite images from throughout the years of musicians, because I know we all love musicians. They're just, there's nothing like a musician. Patty actually walked into the studio with shoes around her neck and her uh, Amish hat on and her long coat, and I thought, don't move, threw up to the the background and did this portrait and then we did a whole other session, but this was the picture that lived on for me. So, you know, I, I was born in, in, in the 60s, so I was like, I kind of miss this photographer, I kind of miss like the early days, like the Jim Marshalls and the Bob Gruens and some of those things, some of the guys that got so, sort of the early stuff. But, um, you know, I got to photograph some of the elderly statesmen of music kind of in uh, their next iteration of their lives. So this is Paul Simon, Art Garfunkel. There's some other. So I, I do a lot of stuff in camera. So, um, and, and, and still we use film, uh, you know, pick and choose our battles. But uh, this was shot on four by five. And uh, this was a triple exposure that we did with, with um, Debbie.
Do you find a separation between your personal work existing in one medium and then professional work existing in another? Or do you ever like st start thinking of an idea and you're like, oh, this actually should be a song as opposed to like a photo series? No, I mean, I think, uh, are you referring to just photography or are you talking about music I'm and talking about you as a musician. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, you know, music is kind of an extension of storytelling for me. So I kind of draw, I mean, I use the, the example that, you know, my experiences as a visual artist help me to be able to write. And that's what I really care about. I'm, I mean, I don't really have a connection to like being on the road and performing. I like, I like words, I like writing, I like the way that, that the imagery kind of sponsors itself within a, in a, in a song. Um, the, I try to make everything that I do, whether it's, and especially in photography where, it's, where you do your personal work and you have your commercial work and you have, uh, you know, the bread and butter work that you don't, you don't necessarily want to show try to interject as much of myself in those moments as possible. And I surprised myself, and more recently in the last 10 years, where I like to flip things on their head a little bit. So I have found in the commercial world, this may not be answering your question totally, but it's kind of like I think relevant to the, the, this group, is that even if you think it is a bad idea, it, you need to talk about it with the creative forces around you because you're a visual artist, right? Like that's your responsibility. If you think you can make something look better, that is really up to you. And so that's the, my philosophy. And I, listen, I have a lot of bad ideas. I'm, I'll be the first to tell you. But um, I think it's important to be able to not separate yourself from the bread and butter and the, and the, and the projects. And you hear that all the time where people are going, you know, that's my personal project, but I'm, you know, I gotta go out and do this headshot. But you know, like, that makes your personal project better when you improve it, so. This was kind of amazing. I, I had a, a few minutes, this is pretty recent. This is a couple years before she passed away, Aretha Franklin. And this was for uh, Harper's Bazaar, I believe, yeah. And we got her for 10 minutes backstage before she went on. And she looked just, she just looked tired, and she was not happy, and she was kind of dragging around, you know, and I said, and she goes, hi, I didn't meet you, let's do this portrait, and I got her to do this kind of moment where she took her mink coat off, she just wanted to wear it, and I had her throw it over her shoulder, took a couple of pictures, and then she went on stage. She got up on stage, and this is the, the life of a musician, and it was like a whole other person. It was like... It, it, she was belting it out and smiling for two hours. I was just, I didn't even know what I was, I was like, how did I fuck that up? <laughs> Kendrick Lamar, great subject. Really uh, intense human being to work with, but very lovely. One of my last pictures I did of, uh, of Allison Krauss and uh, Robert Plant, that was uh, last year in Tennessee. And I throw this one in. This is the last picture from the photography. We're going to show you a couple of, of things kind of relating to the gentleman's question about music. Is that, um, so little Richard had big sunglasses on. He was, he'd already like canceled one shoot and we'd already set up and he wasn't feeling good. So we had to break down and I had to go fly to Atlanta to shoot him. But I was really, I mean, I, the king of rock and one of the kings of rock and roll, I needed to go photograph little Richard before. I couldn't, and uh, and all during the session, right? Like he's he's uh, he's he's going. No, I can't take my glasses. You've got to take your glasses off. No, I can't take my glasses off. I'm just gonna sit right here. Just 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 take my picture, baby. I was like, okay, I'll just take your picture. And I took his picture, and finally I said, look, just give me one without your glasses on. And he goes, all right, I'm gonna give you one. Took his glasses off and made that face. I was using my Hasselblad. Right, I had been shooting digital. I had my house bought on. For some reason, I had to film in the camera. And I shot that one picture. I think I shot another picture of him putting his glasses back on, and that was it. And I got home, and I got the shot. And I, I, know, what he, I know what he's saying. If he could say, if this picture could talk, he'd be like, oh, Lordy, you did not use that picture. 
Um, I wanted to just, David, God bless you. Thank you, b &H. Thank God you're open. Uh, not on Saturday. We're resting. But is there, um, are there any questions I can answer? One question. What's next? What is next? Well, that is, um, gosh, you have to take me out for a drink. On, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, uh, we are working on uh, a couple of big commercial stuff. I'm getting ready for the Oscars this year. It's our last year. We're putting out a book uh, Vanity, with Vanity Fair that we've been uh, designing and working on uh, 10 years. I'm working on a personal project in Montana, which is a little bit top secret, but uh, a, a, new, a new set of portraits. And um, yeah, just staying busy. Hi, um, I'm curious about what kind of tips or tricks that work for you. Kind of what? What kind of like tricks that you use as a photographer tricks? that help bring emotion out of your subjects? Ah, good question. Uh, that, that's a really, really an invaluable, uh, you know, that's, that, that is kind of the biggest uh, tool that I use, and that is research and making somebody feel really comfortable setting an environment where there's a, a relationship kind of instantly. I find that if my subject feels as if I've done my homework and I, and I, and I, you know, I almost kind of introduce myself as somebody who knows them, that there's a, there's a comfort to that. And that, that's really what I do. I, I try to have a lot of fun when I'm working too. So I don't try not to make it too, you know, too serious, but then when I need to get serious, I can kind of move into that. Thank you. I, I believe a couple of questions back here. Oh, go ahead. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever have a really great, crazy idea that you were very excited about, and you took it to the client, and they said, no way? Oh, yeah. Or the artist. Oh, my God. Like the shot so that many. Away? I mean, I built, like, you know, $25,000 sets of my own money, and I've had a, an artist come in and go, like, nah. Not, I'm not going to put on a, a, a Humpty Dumpty outfit. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. It's, uh, it, but, but it's all in the delivery, right? Like, it's, it, 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 if you have an idea, you have to build up to it. So, you know, there's like sketches and pictures and reasons why you're doing it and kind of building like that dialogue. It's very much about um, rapport and about collaboration. So if they feel a part of the process, then things can kind of move in that direction. Not always fully, but yeah, yes sir. So you have um, a, like a triangle. There's you, there's the artist, there's the magazine art director, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about striking that balance because I can see where there's times where the artist is gonna do what they're gonna do no matter what you want or the art director wants. Sure. And then there's times where the art director, you have an idea and the art director just won't go with it, but you bring it up to the artist. Mm -hmm. is, can you get away with that? And how does that triangle work for you? Well, I, again, I, you know, it, it's all about, you know, being uh, flexible. Um, you know, the, the key is that whoever, the, the, the artist is going to, the artist is going to kind of drive where the shoot goes once the shoot's happening. And it's, you know, the, the conversation with the, the, the creative team before is informing me, informing me what they are, want to see out of it. So you're really kind of caught in the middle, right? Like, you don't want to, I hope this answers your question, you don't want to uh, forget about the, 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 the client, which is the, the magazine or the client, you know, the person that's hiring you, and the artist, you've got to obviously get participation from. So it's a balance, right? So, um, you know, it's a negotiation sometimes, but at the end of the day, an artist is going to decide how much he's going to do, and you just, like, you got to make the best of it. I mean, I've been so disappointed sometimes, and I live with that, but you can never show it. And I think that was a really big thing. My ego, I needed to draw my ego in a lot of situations because I want to work with people. I want to do great work with them, and they're artists, right? They're, they have a visual language that they are used to. So, yeah, I mean, I think what happens now in music, because music's very different now, right? Like, musicians have creative teams and creative directors, and they're all trying to tell you what to do, so you, it gets a little sloppy. 
right here. I was just wondering, having worked so long in photography, have there been moments when you found yourself completely doubting your ability to continue taking photographs? And if and when those have occurred, how have you then sort of worked through those ruts to continue working? Well, that, that's interesting. Um, you know, I, I have struggled with that. That's a really good question. And, and, and I think when I'm inactive is when I'm, when I'm kind of, you know, in that moment of like doubt uh, or when I, you know, typically, I don't do it all the time when I was starting out until probably pretty recent, I would just like drill myself after a shoot, like, why didn't you, oh, which, which, I should have done that or whatever. But, you know, that's the process is never like letting, letting yourself be satisfied with what you're doing. And also I feel like the minute that I'm kind of done with something, like, for instance, the stairwell project. When I was done with it, you, you couldn't pay me enough money to go in there and do another portrait. It was, you know, the project was over with. So I, I'm pretty good about cutting, you know, off a, a toe when, when, after I'm done, you know, running on it and moving on to the next thing. I do have a lot of, um, you know, I have a good toolkit. So I, I do go back and I use things technically over again, but I try to rethink the, the language, you know, and, and use photography as more of a, you know, as more of a pen than, or as I said, a paintbrush rather than like, you know, just going out and taking a picture. I always feel like if I don't go out and do something that I see, then that sort of makes me miserable too. <laughs> All right, that was. The, That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's, That's a wrap. <laughs> you guys are great.